I'm calling. I'm calling him. Mm, he's coming. A few years ago, a cow was born in Israel. Her name was Melody. She was special. She was pure red from nose to tail. And that got a lot of people excited. Rabbis from Jerusalem, Pentecostal pastors from Oklahoma, CNN reporters, everyone took an interest in Melody. Why? Because they all wondered, was Melody a sign of the apocalypse. That's because Melody was connected to here. Most scholars believe that the great Jewish temple once stood here on the Temple Mount. Jewish and Christian prophecies say that rebuilding the temple will signal the end of days. But there are a few problems with building the temple. You can't build it unless those who walk its grounds are purified. And the Torah, the five books of Moses, says that can only be done with the ashes of a pure red heifer ritually sacrificed. The last kosher red heifer appeared over 2,000 years ago. And so, there was a bit of excitement when Melody was born. Did Melody's birth mean the end was nigh? Well, we can't answer that question without answering a few others. I want to show you something. So we'll get back to Melody in a bit. But first, there's another problem with trying to build a temple here. Something's there already. Muslims believe that from here the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven to receive instruction on prayer. And this is the crux of the problem. The holiest site in Judaism is also the third most important site in Islam. Make no mistake, people die for this piece of real estate. For thousands of years, Jews, Babylonians, Romans, Muslims, Crusaders, all shed blood, each wanting to control this piece of land. As they die today, how will these rival claims, Jew and Muslim, coexist? And how does an archaeologist work in such a complicated environment? Now, a quick lesson, temple history. The Bible says King Solomon built a temple 3,000 years ago. For Jews, it was God's house on earth. The temple's legendary treasures included the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments. But those treasures disappeared when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. Within a century, the Israelites started rebuilding. By the time of Jesus, the temple was one of the world's great buildings. But it fell again when the Romans attacked in 70 AD. So why is there no archaeology to prove Solomon's temple ever existed? Well, this isn't an easy place to dig. This is Dan Bahat. He doesn't work on Islamic sites. The nearest he gets is digging round the edges. So he's taking me into a tunnel just outside the Temple Mount. This is one, maybe one of the most exciting points in the Western Wall. We are standing, we are touching now a stone, which is the largest building stone ever found in this country. It weighs 600 metric tons, which is enormous. I believe inside here, we have, there is a vault, let's say an underground storage place or something of the like. So wait a minute, wait a minute. So if you're telling me that on the other side of this are substructures to the, temp the holiest place on earth, why aren't you blasting through the wall and trying to find, be an Indiana Jones and find uh, all sorts of treasures? So we are with very good relations with the Muslims. They know what we are doing and with the pretext that we don't go in under the Temple Mount. Behind these stones, there could be a 2,000-year-old vault. The prospect is tantalizing, but Bahat can't open it. Because here, archaeology can be a matter of life and death. In 1996, this tunnel was opened to make a fire exit. 
Right over there, the, yeah, the exit yes. to this to tunnel this, the, the entire system, created yes. a whole big riot. Yes, the mosque. They thought this tunnel was, was under their way. mosque. Exactly so. Everybody got really started. upset. Everyone, of course, you can imagine. I will be upset if I see a Muslim digging under my, my synagogue. The tunnel does not go under the dome. But distrust led to... 15 Israeli soldiers were killed in those riots and over 70 Palestinians. This well, is a bloodbath. It talking. was, it was, it was a real terrible... All thing. over an opening, opening to this tunnel. Yes, that's Jerusalem. Muslim and Jew both lay claim to this sacred piece of land. Both have died for it. But what if there was an archaeological solution to the conflict? This is Tuvia Sagiv author of a revolutionary theory. Wait a minute, I just realized something. You can be a big peacemaker if you're right. We can live together. The Arabs and the Jewish people, you will be in the left and the right, and we will be in the center. You cannot achieve Middle East peace without deciding the fate of the Temple Mount. This man thinks he has a solution. Okay, so let's just review a second. We're looking right now, which is yes. the Dome of the Rock, this gold dome, right? Exactly. The conventional wisdom is that was built over the Holy of Holies yes. in the ancient Jewish temple. This is the traditional way of thinking. Right. Sagiv challenges tradition. He's an architect, but he has a hobby, the Temple Mount. And he's reached a revolutionary conclusion about the location of Solomon's temple. Maybe the conclusion is that maybe it's here, but not in the Dome of the Rock. And we have to ask ourselves, where is a rational place in which we can put it? That's right. Sagiv says the temple didn't stand where the dome is. His theory is complex, but it boils down to three main pieces of evidence. One, architectural footprint. Two, infrared photography. And three, water flow. We find that one of the problems in the temple was supply of water for the holy bath of the high priest and also to clean the court from the blood. In from order, all the sacrifices. Exactly, and a lot of animals were sacrificed and there was a lot of blood in the court and they have to clean it. This takes us back to Melody. The temple's most important function was sacrifice. And there was lots of it. So much so that the priests needed an aqueduct pumping water into the temple to wash away the blood. Archaeologists think they found the aqueduct. But if the temple stood where the dome is, here, and the aqueduct flowed from here, we have a problem. Sagiv calculates the aqueduct is 20 meters lower than the dome of the rock. Water doesn't flow uphill. The conclusion, it means that we have to lower the level of the temple in order that this water will supply water to the court. And then it means that, that it can't be in the Dome of the Rock. Because there's a rock there. There is a rock there. Then it must be in another place. But anyhow, in this place, it's impossible. Sagiv's theory runs against most archaeologists, rabbis and historians. But what about Muslim sensibilities? Adnan Husseini runs the Islamic Trust overseeing the Dome of the Rock. I asked him about the future of the Mount. This is a mosque for Muslims to pray. Yeah, but what, about, what about the history and the temple and all that? But if you wanted to bring the history back, there is many things should be changed, really. And I think if everything would be changed back according to the history, it's nonsense. It's not logic, really. Peace can never be uh, uh, achieved by looking for the history, you know. Ah, but history says there was a temple here. I'm not even talking about the Jewish one. I'm talking about another temple, a pagan one. And it's at the heart of Sagiv's plan. There is a tradition of building holy sites on top of each other. Conquistadors planted churches over Mayan temples. Hindus and Muslims battle over who was the chicken and who the egg. Even the Vatican sits atop the pagan temple of Sibyl and Attic. So it would make sense for the Dome of the Rock to be built over the Jewish temple. This tradition leads us to Sagiv's next piece of evidence, architectural footprint. Holy places have traditions, and I agree with you, and we know this archaeologically. Exactly. People don't just come and build a holy place. Exactly. Even if they, whatever, they, whatever religion they are, if they're building a church or a mm -hmm. mosque, or, 
There's a, a synagogue, there's a tradition. Now, the fact is that you have two mosques. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that they ignored the holy place of the temple exactly. and they built two mosques exactly where the temple wasn't? How is that possible? I will try to show you. You have an I, answer for this? Yes. The Jewish temple fell. The Romans built their own pagan temple on the site. That temple is long gone, but the same architect built another temple in Lebanon. This is the area of photograph? This is the area, this is the area of Jupiter temple. Oh, this looks like the... The same builder, the same era, and even dedicated to the same god, Jupiter. So we can speculate. The Lebanon temple may be a model for the missing Roman temple on the mount. And guess what happens when we compare the layout of the Jupiter temple and the temple mount? I put together Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the War, Jupiter Temple in Baalbek, and look, it's the same thing. So maybe what we see here is the ruins of Jupiter Temple, which the Arabs decided to cover it with Muslim dress and make it to a mosque. So, now, so just, just before I get as excited as you are, I just want to understand, you're saying when the Muslims built their holy places, yes. they did build it on the ruins of, of, the of holy places, exactly. but it was not the, the Jewish, Jewish temple. It was the pagan pe project. It was the pagan Roman temple. project. Exactly. So where did the Jewish temple go? The Holy of Holies. Well, we get the answer straight from the horse's mouth. Historians say the Roman temple had a horse's statue in between the two main temple buildings. And where the statue used to stand in the courtyard. Exactly. That's where the trees are. That's where the Jewish holy place exactly. was. Exactly, and this was the sign. If you, know, you want to know where is the place of the holy of the holy, ask where is the place of the horse. And to put the horse on the holy of the holy means I conquered the Jewish temple. There's a debate in Israel. Is the temple simply a metaphor? Will God build a physical temple? Or will it be built by man? I went to meet one man who sees it as his personal responsibility to clear the ground for the third Jewish temple. Coming back to the Temple Mount is an historical justice. The Arab occupation of the Temple Mount of Jerusalem is finished. This is Gershon Solomon, 15 years ago, marching on the Temple Mount. 15 years, you haven't changed. <laughs> this is Gershon Solomon now. He leads the Temple Mount Faithful, a group dedicated to rebuilding the temple the Romans knocked over 2,000 years ago. I asked him how he could build the temple where the dome now stands. Take the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa, mosque and we shall do the, the government will do it is a great favor for the muslims put them in a big envelope and mail them back to mecca mail them mail them you don't mean literally yeah see in egypt you know the the the, the ancient uh, temples were moved when they built the aswan dam tens sometimes hundreds of of kilometers from the from the uh, original place why not here so you want to move those, those Muslim holy places, rebuild the temple, trigger the end of days, and we all live happily, not, not we I, all live happily ever after. Not only I want, God wants. Solomon's marches usually number a couple dozen followers, but fervor outweighs numbers. In 1990, rumors spread among Palestinians that Gershon Solomon was marching to the Dome of the Rock. Riots erupted and 17 people died. The threat of violence, politics, and religion prevent us from digging in this holy ground. So, Sagiv took to the air for the next piece of evidence, infrared. You had Israeli police yes. take in a helicopter, in helicopter infrared shots. Exactly. And, and, what, and, and now I want to show you the pictures. And you, you, it's, you yourself will decide, do we see something here or it's nonsense? Okay. Maybe. Here you see the Maybe Tuvia is imagining yeah, exactly. it all. Because Tuvia says that it's under the trees. Yes. Infrared cameras read heat. Different objects reflect heat in different ways. 
This allows infrared cameras to reveal what the naked eye cannot see. So, if we look at a photo from early in the morning when things are cool, you can see that the flow is clear and white. Flow right, itself, no shadows. No shadows. But look what happens at night, after the land has been heated all day by the Jerusalem sun. And look what happens in the middle of the night. Oh my, you, oh my God, that's amazing. You see here the trees, and in between them, you have straight lines. And the width of the, the lines here oh, you're is... You're talking about the in-between. In-between, you see lines, you see straight lines. And this is 10 meters, 10 meters, and 10 meters. The width of the, the temple uh, walls was 20 cubic, which means about 10 meters. Each and wall was 10 each, meters wide. Exactly. And I say, maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. What we see here is the reflection of the walls of the temple. Okay, wait, 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 wait. So here, here we got, you see, that's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And that's the Dome of the Rock. And you're saying, okay, it's got to be there somewhere. It can't be that high. Yeah, exactly. The only place it might be is In the under, only, under the trees. Under the trees. Exactly. I was saying goodbye to Sagiv when I realized something, something shocking. I just realized something. According to your theory, if you're right and you showed me that everything can be peaceful because the Muslims can have the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, this beautiful design where everybody's happy. The Jews have the temple, the Muslims have the dome, the Christians can go to either side wherever they please. Everything is nice and beautiful, except you've actually broken down the holiest place in Judaism, the Western Wall, to make room to go to where you say the temple is. Yes, because in the moment my theory will be proved, you will understand, it means that there will be no objection to break this Paganic Wall. Now you, this pagan wall, when you say, let's smash it, let's take a big yes. ball and smash it down, some people might have a problem with that. Why do we pray here? Because uh, that's the connection with the, t with the temple. All right, and then move, smash the wall, because it's not important. Smash the wall because it's not important. Because, because what what's is important is the space behind yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. Okay, controversial, yes. Let's Has Sagiv found the path to peace? Gershon Solomon and Adnan Husseini don't agree on much but they do agree on three things. One, it's the land under the Dome of the Rock that is sacred. Two, they cannot share it. And three, Tuvia Sagiv. Let me tell you first that he's a nice guy. <laughs> but I am so sorry to disappoint you. It has no, it don't make sense. I have not another word, nonsense. And the, the fact that in the midst of the Temple Mount it exists, the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim building, and a mosque, it, it, it scared people. How can we remove it? We shall make, as you said, a nuclear war, uh, what no, else? But, no, but I don't think he was motivated. You're saying he was motivated by fear. Why don't I find a space where there's no Muslim? Yeah, on the Temple Mount, can exist only one thing, I think, one building, the house of God, the temple. This is the word of God. And how does Tuvia's plan, the Muslims up top and the Jews below, look to the Muslims? Can never work. This is, yeah, these ideas, it's, it's not ideas which respect the place. Oh, I mean underneath, underneath. Yeah. If you play underneath a place, you know, you're not respecting the place. This place is, is built on rock. If you will play underneath, it means you will demolish it. Let's, let's, let's deal with things, you know. It's, it's, it's a very important place. It's a very beautiful place, you know. Enjoy it as a beautiful place, you know. And let us enjoy our religion in this place. Let's not mix things. Mixing things in such sensitive places is dangerous. Finally, a consensus. Everyone agrees no to Tuvia Sagiv's plan. Now, back to Melody. The pure red heifer ushering in the end of days. 
The Torah says the pure red heifer must be three years old at the time of the sacrifice. Her ashes used to purify those who work in the temple. So what became of Melody? Things were going according to plan. Rabbis were keeping a watchful eye. A year went by. Then, at the age of 18 months, Melody sprouted a tuft of white hair on her tail. The end of days was put on hold. Guys, I'm a vegetarian. I'm a friend. There are always going to be surprises. You don't have to speak the language to be able to interact with people. Knowing that can make you look at history in a new and exciting way. I'm going on an adventure. Only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. It's not very far away. Whatever one believes, there is one certainty. We will never know if the predictions in these hit in a new and exciting way. He's in what does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi. How are you? Oh, look at that. I, I need a, a plan. Archaeology. This is a story about stolen treasure. When do we divide the gold? And lots of golden booty. And yes, we divide the gold. This is a story about stolen treasure. And we divide the gold. And lots of golden booty. And yes, this tale will take us out on the high seas in sailing ships, but it really begins in the mountains or the Judean hills. Okay, hold on, guys. Hold on. Because we're hunting for treasure that hold came on, from the temple in Jerusalem. We're in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, across from one of the holiest places on earth. The Muslims call it the Dome of the Rock. According to Islam, it's where Muhammad ascended to heaven to learn the ways of prayer. For Jews, it's the Temple Mount. Why? Because if you went back in time, 3,000 years, on that exact spot, you'd see the Temple of Solomon, one of the wonders of the earth, built by King Solomon. And it was there to house the symbols of ritual, of communication between God and mankind. The temple treasures were considered holy hotlines to God. The Golden Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments. The massive candelabra or menorah was designed by God himself, and it was made from one piece of gold. The silver trumpets of truth were blown by the high priest to mark the beginning and end of every workday. And the gorgeous gold and bejeweled table of the Divine Presence held the fresh bread, blessed by God, ensuring a successful annual grain harvest. This was some serious booty. Control these and you had access to God, who controls heaven, the seas, and all between and below. So what happened to the temple treasure? Where did it go? And how come King Solomon's temple is not there anymore? With a keen eye for clues in history, I can answer the temple questions, and, as crazy as it may sound, I think I can find the priceless temple treasures. In 586 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, sacked Jerusalem, and his massive army burned and knocked Solomon's temple down. He captured all the Jewish people and took them back to Babylon. And he claimed their temple treasure. Ancient records show that Nebuchadnezzar took everything but the Ark of the Covenant. Many legends claim the Ark was secretly hidden before the Babylonians attacked the temple. So before I go to Babylon, I'm starting my hunt. Here, 
deep underneath the Temple Mount, where archaeologist Dan Bahat has uncovered evidence that points to an ancient secret vault. This is one of the most exciting points in the Western Wall. We are touching now a stone, which is the largest building stone ever found in this country. It weighs 600 metric tons, which is enormous. I believe inside here there is a vault, let's say an underground storage place or something of the like. So could it be, in theory, a storage of the temple? That's what I believe it is. Really? Precisely that, yes. I'll tell you more than that. This, uh, so are you going to find the lost Ark of the Covenant hidden on the other side? What do you mean? Side? I'm an Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you blasting through the wall and be an Indiana Jones and find uh, all sorts of treasures? People are expecting me to find the Ark of the Covenant. It will be never found. Because in the book of Maccabees, it describes how po Prophet Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant to Mount Nebo. The book of Maccabees says that Jeremiah stashed the Ark in a cave up here on Mount Nebo in Jordan. But there has never been anything found up here. Many academics are convinced that the Ark was destroyed when King Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Solomon's temple back in 586 BCE, because after that moment, ancient references to the Ark disappear. However, the Babylonians did make off with the bigger booty. All the treasures except the Ark were taken to Babylon. There, they stayed for almost 50 years until Cyrus, king of the Persians, overthrew Babylon, freed the Jews, and allowed them to return to their land. It was then that they brought back the sacred objects of Solomon's temple. So, I may not be able to find the Ark, but with the help of this exact model of ancient Jerusalem, I can put myself back in time to uncover clues to the other treasure's whereabouts. I just need to get things down to scale. That's good. And the Jewish people came back from Babylon and they built the second temple right over Solomon's temple, the first temple. And this is what it looked like. And, well, not exactly like that. It was bigger. It was magnificent. And inside that Holy of Holies, that's where the high priest had the temple treasure. They had everything they had before in the first temple, except the Ark of the Covenant that went missing. But they had everything else, the menorah, the trumpets, the golden table. They had everything, worth millions even in those days, priceless really. But in today's terms, in hard cash, billions. And guess what? The second temple wasn't just the holiest place to worship and store expensive holy things. It was a bank, a massive bank for all of Israel, kind of like an ancient Fort Knox. It housed gold and silver reserves, and it was where the temple's tax collection was deposited. Inside the temple, at any given time, was what today would be billions and billions of dollars worth of gold and silver, in the form of coins and big bricks called talents. So what happened to the second temple? Why is it not there? And what happened to the temple treasure and to the gold and silver talents? Well, in 70 CE, 27 years after the death of Jesus, Rome sacked Jerusalem, destroyed it. The Emperor Vespasian sent his son and best general, Titus, to knock down the second temple of Jerusalem. And all the clues we need to figure out what the Romans did with the treasure are in an ancient history book written by a man named Josephus. The greatest written authority that we have is Flavius Josephus. He's an eyewitness to the events that happened to Jerusalem and to the temple treasure. What does he have to say about the temple treasure? Josephus writes that the Romans grabbed all the temple booty, including the great menorah, and they made off like toga-wearing bandits back to Rome. And that's where this treasure hunt takes us. Rome. It's the year 70 CE. The Roman legions have sacked Jerusalem, stolen its holy temple treasures, and we've chased them back to Rome to witness a triumph celebration unlike any seen before. Here is where it all started, at the Pantheon. Not this Pantheon, which was built in 118, but the earlier Pantheon destroyed by a fire. Imagine the scene. The Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus were right here. They were dedicated to their gods and started marching. And this is where the temple treasure was made ready to be paraded along what I call the Via della Menorah. They took it all the way through Rome, 
throngs of cheering people as the holiest objects in Judaism were suddenly paraded as trophies of victorious Rome. But where did the treasure end up? If we read Josephus, we can actually draw a treasure map tracing the path of the menorah and the other temple riches as they were paraded through Rome. Vespasian and Titus made their way from the Pantheon to the Circus Flaminus. Here, they were heralded by tens of thousands. Historian Alan Epstein shows me that the Circus Flaminus, the first station in this triumphal parade, is today covered by a very interesting building. We're standing in front of the major synagogue of Rome. This synagogue was built when? Uh, 1904. But this is where they brought the temple treasure after conquering Jerusalem in 70, starting it here, parading it all around the city so that everyone can see. And so there's a synagogue right on the spot where this temple treasure began its, its triumphal march through the city. That's a real irony. Well, that's history. History is irony. And it's the irony of unintended consequences. The irony is intriguing. But I'm not interested in irony. I'm interested in gold. Epstein tells me that almost 2,000 years ago, they paraded the treasures from here into the Teatro de Marcello, which held 11,000 spectators. This is all part of the theater of Marcellus. This was the prototype of the Colosseum, and of course, it extends into the ancient part, which is around. We're now at the front part where the stage was. But the gold wasn't left on the stage. According to Josephus, the treasure parade left this amphitheater march down the Vicus Jagarius and through the Circus Maximus. Just a park now, but back then, it held an estimated 250,000 screaming Romans. The holiest items of Judea were then taken into the famous Roman Forum, where the Senate was housed and their most sacred temple stood. And it's here where we find the best clue yet. Actual archaeological evidence of the menorah and the rest of the temple treasures carved into Roman stone. This is the Arch of Titus. This is it. The Arch of Titus is the commemoration of the triumph of Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, built directly on the path that they marched into Rome after the destruction of Jerusalem. I met with historian Leah Klein, who explained to me the significance of this structure. So this is literally, it's kind of a still frame of one of the most incredible moments in history. It was a big deal. On this panel on the south side, it's the beginning of the triumphal procession into the city of Rome. And you can see them proceeding with all of their booty to show the people in the Senate of Rome what they were able to accomplish and what they were to bring back. This booty, obviously, is the most important booty. You see the menorah, um, and you have soldiers holding it on their shoulders. As it is brought to Rome, it represents Rome's dominance of, of the known universe at that time. So are you saying that the temple treasure literally was paraded where we're standing now? It would have been paraded on this route. It would have come up from what is now the Colosseum, uphill, and then proceed down through the Roman Forum. As Leah takes me down the Via Sacra, the oldest and most important road in Rome, we follow the treasure's path, and she paints a vivid scene. Any of the areas in the Forum that were not covered with buildings would have been clamoring with people. At the front of the procession would have been Vespasian and Titus together, riding on what's a, called a quadriga which is a four-horse chariot with these four white horses. Behind them would have been a series of guards, uh, lictors, holding the standards of the emperor. And then behind them would have been the marching troops in which they were carrying the booty. Following the booty was Shimon Bar Giora, the leader of the Jewish revolt, walking his last steps before execution. Behind him were thousands of his Jewish people, now slaves to Rome. Quite a show. It was quite a show, absolutely. Rome was all about the spectacle, and this was the utmost of spectacles. And, and bringing these spoils back meant that Rome um, had pacified part of the world. I can't help but shoulder my menorah in a symbolic gesture. How many people know of this triumphant and tragic tale of stolen holy treasures? Did she tell you about the menorah? The temple treasure of Jerusalem was taken right through here. Did you know that? It went all the way up there. And that's, that's the Arch of Titus, right over there. Did you see it? No, I didn't see <laughs> you're, it when you're, I was there. I'll have to get it? back. No, did no. you see it? No, didn't oh, you yeah. want to schlep my menorah? You want me to schlep your menorah? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> your menorah is very heavy. <laughs> you want to come to see it? Did you see it? We're starting a new custom, the Via della Menorah. <laughs> see, there's the Arch of Titus. There's the silver trumpets. 
And there is the menorah. And they paraded it at various stations along this exact route. And they buried it where? Now that's a good question. Jerusalem's treasure, stolen and paraded around Rome. Did the Latin looters bury it or melt it down? Is it so crazy to think that I can find it? Leah Klein takes me to the edge of the Forum to see the Temple of Peace, or what's left of it. This shows you a map of what was there in the color blocks. She tells me that after the triumphal procession, a new Roman temple was built here to display the booty from Roman conquests. Okay, I'm excited because I feel that we're standing where the temple treasure was for centuries. Well, it's certainly um, a tourist attraction even in the Roman period. Temple of Peace was more of an art museum than a temple. And what we understand is that the menorah, the golden table, and the silver trumpets were brought to the Temple of Peace and put on display. And what you're seeing in these outlines of, of wall foundation um, and marble tile um, is a garden structure that would have been in front of the, the temple itself. The excavations are going on right now? They have been going on in the last several years by an Italian university. The problem with this particular area is the modern road behind us. It was put up by Mussolini and it has completely destroyed the archaeology beneath it. So this is as much as we probably will find, at least in this, in this lifetime. And we very well may be standing over where the menorah had been housed? That or the buses behind us, directly, however mundane that might be. <laughs> Could the holiest icons of Judea really be buried underneath a Roman bus stop? Did the Romans permanently imprison the treasure's divine energy under the so-called Temple of Peace? Josephus gives us more clues. And this is what he has to say. The Emperor Vespasian, like any savvy pirate, split up the booty. And like any savvy money holder, he invested a lot of it in real estate. We're circling the Colosseum, stuck in a Roman traffic jam. The Colosseum is an amazing structure. The biggest amphitheater on the planet, an engineering marvel. In today's terms, it would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars, more expensive than a 3D Hollywood IMAX film. Where did they get the money? To answer that question, I needed to get inside for a little clapping and a lesson from Colosseum expert Mino okay. Carboni. Where are we? Oh, we are in uh, the symbol of Rome, Colosseum. It is the largest amphitheater in the Roman Empire. It was built to accommodate some 70,000 people. And uh, they took only eight years just to complete it. Uh, 2,000 years ago, this was built. The place would be full, like 70 to 100,000 people. The Roman emperor was here. Everybody was here. What were they doing here? They were feeding Christians to the lion? No. What? We have no evidence that they gave Christians to feed animals in the arena. The arena had three different functions. In the morning, the venazione, which is the fighting between gladiators and animals. Then at noon, we had the public execution of regular criminals in the arena. The matinee was gladiators again against uh, animals. animals yes lunchtime that was public execution. execution in the afternoon day the moon era gladiators against the gladiators gladiator against, against gladiator, gladiator. mano was, a mano this was just the use of the Colosseum when fighting but they also had a particular performances especially when they want to reproduce mythology or the very important greek dramas for this reason they changed the the stage the stage is the huge platform down there this this was filled in right we're seeing a big hole here. Yes. We're actually seeing uh, underneath the stage. Indeed. So what's the connection between the Colosseum, which was built by Vespasian, and the wars in Jerusalem, the destruction of That's Jerusalem? That's a very interesting question. We know for sure that uh, a big number of prisoners came to Rome. All of, the, of them were Jewish, and all of them yes. built the Colosseum here. Yeah. They built this place? Yes. So imagine how many thousand people had to wear how much money they needed. So we're, we're talking in today's money, over a billion dollars, oh. thousands of slaves. I don't think we can give a value. In a way, you could say that the Colosseum is built on the ashes of Jerusalem's temple. On Jerusalem. We can say that since they defeated, they destroyed the second temple, the money for the Colosseum came from the booty of Jerusalem, for, of course, because they need a lot of money. It's a strong statement to make. The greatest symbol of Rome built on conquered Jewish backs with the blood and gold of Judea. But Mino tells me the proof is written in marble. He shows me a massive altar-like stone that he believes used to sit above the emperor's entrance 
to the Colosseum. This is a block of marble, actually, and there is a beautiful inscription, 4th century inscription. It's late. It's very late. It's not an inscription that belonged to the 1st century AD. Actually, no. Mino tells me that the chiseled Latin in this stone describes how Lampadius, a prefect of Rome, had the Colosseum restored in 443 CE. There's nothing that mentions the Jewish temple treasure or the emperors that we're interested in. But, but this inscription doesn't really say Vespasian or Titus. No, of course, it's been deleted. Uh, we can see some holes. Normally, a very original inscription was a chisel in the marble, then fill in with the bronze letters that were claps against the marble with the pins inside. We can see the holes everywhere. So let me see if I understand. You're telling me that the inscription I see with my eyes, this inscription is not the original inscription. Yes, you're right. This was added. Layer. And the way we know what the original inscription is from the pin marks, because yes. they were holding bronze letters. Yes. The bronze normally was added just to give a shining to the inscription on the marble. So can we retrieve the original inscription? Can we tell by the pins? Yes, you can reconstruct piece by piece just following the holes that were used for the bronze letters. So we can connect the dots. Yes, you can. And that's exactly what archaeologists did in 2001. They deciphered the puzzle that showed that this inscription was added in the 4th century. Stonemasons chipped away the evidence of the earlier 1st century inscription. But the older pinholes, still visible in the surface today, clearly correspond to different lettering. So what does the inscription actually say when you connect the dots? They say that the, the amphitheater was built by the emperor Vespasian with a share of the booty coming from the Jewish wars. To show the world that Vespasian, in building the Colosseum, wanted to share the booty with them, building just a public amphitheater. So basically, this is a real piece of archaeological detective work that, taken together with the Arch of Titus, shows proof positive that the temple treasure came here, but also that the temple treasure was used to build the greatest building in the world at that time. Yes, I agree. So it's true. The Emperor Pirate Vespasian had split the booty. He spent the most liquid assets on the Colosseum and, most likely, on many other Roman structures of the time. When we look at this marvelous feat of Roman engineering, we know now that it was built with temple treasure, but not all the treasure. I found ancient writings that tell us the Romans kept the holiest temple icons intact, safe, solid, and unspent inside their temple of peace. These writings describe yet another looting of the booty, and they tell us where the treasure went and where it still may be. But to find Jerusalem's gold, we'll just have to wait until next time on The Naked Archaeologist. He's a tall, tall man, from a tall, tall man. You want to know what I'm doing? You know, it's not seminar. I know you're probably thinking, me being the naked archaeologist, I've got, I found it. That's, that's another episode. Uh -huh.